Hi, thank you so much for joining me for Sensory Basics. I'm Erin Gruitt and I'm about to walk you through just some basic information about our sensory systems, about sensory processing, and about arousal. Then I'll end with a few strategies that will hopefully help you in your daily activities. If you have questions, you can email me at erin at sensationalpath.com and I'd be more than happy to help you with or to answer your questions. Okay, so welcome to Sensory Basics. As I mentioned, my name is Erin Gruitt and I am an occupational therapist with training in sensory integration. I've taken numerous courses, including the Sensory Integration and Praxis Test. Um, and I'm happy to share this information with you. You may wonder why I think that sensory basics and sensory information is so important, and I'll explain that. Okay, so as I mentioned, our goals are to increase your understanding of our sensory systems, to increase your understanding of sensory processing, to increase your understanding of arousal and how to recognize different levels of arousal, and then we'll end with some strategies for easing daily activities, whether you're a teacher, a parent, a caregiver, or maybe you have sensory issues of your own. Okay, whoops, sorry, I'm gonna go back. So we always learn, or we learn in school, that we have five sensory systems. Our sense of touch, which is our whole body, um, our vision in our eyes, taste in our mouth, hearing in our ears, and smell in our nose. Well, did you know that we actually have more than five sensory systems? We have two movement senses that are really important in sensory processing. We have our vestibular sense, and that is processed in our inner ears, and that tells us if we're moving or staying still. It tells us if our head is upright or upside down, and it has a, a big role, like I said, in um, our arousal and how alert we are. If you think about getting motion sick. You think of the feeling that you get um, if you've ever gotten motion sick and you're driving in a car, that's your vestibular system working over time. Okay, so it's a really strong system. Then our proprioceptive sense, that is information that's processed within our muscles and our joints. Okay, it gives us information that helps to calm our body. It, it has a big part in our level of alertness and being able to be in a just right state. Um, our proprioceptive sense is things like push-pull activities. Um, you see this little boy on the monkey bars. So he's hanging on the bars. He's getting input to his muscles and joints in his hands and in his arms. So we talk about sensory our sensory systems and sensory processing because our senses are the building blocks for higher development and learning and behavior. Okay, now you don't need to learn or memorize this slide here, but I put it up because it shows that our sensory systems are at the bottom. They're the foundation. So just like building a house, you need a strong foundation. Okay. And they, that strong foundation leads to sensory motor development. Things like having awareness of two sides of your hands, being able to plan your motor actions, um, knowing where your body is, um, eye-hand coordination, 
And then at the top of our pyramid is academic learning, daily living activities and behavior. So as an occupational therapist, I don't often get referrals that say, please look at my child's vestibular system. I would get a referral that would be one of the higher levels. So daily living activities or academic learning or behavior or eye-hand coordination. But we need to come back and look at the foundation. I'm going to show you a clip from a video now. Um, and this is a child's view of sensory processing. I think it will work. I like to read comics and I also like to go to school. Something I know a lot about and want to tell you about is sensory processing disorder. SPD is when the messages that your brain gets from its senses are not organized. So you don't respond to things like most people do. This makes it hard to do everyday life stuff like getting ready for the day, going to school, eating and playing. You can have SPD by itself or you can have it with other things like autism. I have autism and SPD. Everyone has seven sensory systems. They are sound, taste, smell, vision, touch, proprioceptive, and vestibular. So I just wanted to show you that little clip from the child's view of sensory processing. Feel free to Google it and watch it over and over. I think it's, it's a great explanation of um, our sensory systems. Oops. Hmm. Okay, one second, I just gotta get back to our PowerPoint. All right, so I really like how that boy uses the analogy of cups. We have different cups that represent um, how we process sensory information. So um, you may be over responsive to things if you have a small cup. 
okay? And um, this might look like you're hypersensitive to sensations. You're bothered by smells if you have a small cup for that smell sensation. You're bothered by touch if you have a small cup for touch sensations. If you have a small cup for movement, you may be sensitive to being in the car or you don't like heights. Um, if you have a small cup for sounds, then you're bothered by loud, unexpected sounds. And if you have a small cup for touch, then you may really be bothered by haircuts and grooming and dressing, okay? So what this looks like or the behaviors that we see when we see somebody who is sensory over responsive is the fussy, dysregulated baby, the um, irritability and aggression or fight or flight. So in this picture, you see fear and anger. Those are the characters from um, the movie Inside Out. And it's a great movie for watching and, and seeing these different emotions, right? Um, you may also, these kids or these people are also upset by transitions and changes because when there's, up, when there's changes and transitions, we don't know what's coming next. We can't anticipate and that can cause a lot of fear um, and or responsiveness. Okay, if you're under responsive, you have a big cup and it takes more input to fill that cup. Um, so this might look like a high pain threshold, somebody who doesn't cry when they're seriously hurt. It could be somebody that doesn't notice when they've been touched or somebody who doesn't notice when you call their name over and over and over. Um, these people may um, always or nearly always prefer sedentary activities. So activities where they're sitting, they can be unaware of the need to use the toilet. Okay, so toilet training can be difficult with these under responsive types. Um, they may be passive, quiet, and withdrawn. And so at school, they're not seen as a problem child because they're sitting there quietly. They're not disturbing the rest of the class, but they're not really getting it. They're not really processing the information. Okay, they might often get lost in their own fantasy world, okay? They're daydreaming. They may exhibit no inner drive to get involved in the world, so their motivation is low. These can be kids who eat and eat, but don't feel full, okay? So I've heard cases where parents are locking the fridge or parents are locking the cupboards because the child can't, um, they, they don't, they can't notice when they're full, I guess is, is how I should say it. Okay, they're not registering that they're full. So registration is when the messages get sent to the brain from the stomach saying, you know what, I'm full, I can stop eating now. They don't get that message or they don't get it until it's too late and they're really full. Okay, and I have down here different, different than dissociative. So a child who's dissociative is a child who is in overload. And we'll talk about overload here in the next couple slides, but um, if you're in overload, then you can start to look like an under-responsive child because you've shut down. Okay, so in this slide, I like to point to my slides, so I can't point right now, but um, if we talk about C, that is a typical nervous system, a sensory non-defensive. So let's say you and I have typical nervous systems, this would be us. So we wake up, we go throughout our day at an optimal level of arousal. So we're happy, we're functioning, we're getting along with others, we're playing, we're pleasant, okay? Um, there may be sensory events that increase our level of arousal, but we recover and we don't tend to go into sensory overload. Maybe this isn't me, um, but anyways, for the most part, we stay within that optimal range of arousal. There may be highs and lows, and um, if there's multiple events, so at the bottom of the screen, you see sensory events over time. So when there's 
an event, one event after another after another, those things accumulate. So they build up on top of each other. And that can, that can send us into a sensory overload. But the big difference between a non-defensive and a defensive is that a non-defensive person can recover from that sensory overload or those sensory events adding up over time. Whereas if you look at B, that's a sensory defensive, um, they start out at an optimal range and then as those sensory events add up, their level of arousal starts to increase and there's less recovery between those events. So for example, you have a child who is sensitive to touch, they're sensory defensive because they have a small cup um, for touch and as those, you know, they wake up, let's say they wake up in the morning, um, they're functioning okay, but then they have to get dressed, they have to do all these grooming activities like brushing their hair and brushing their teeth, and they don't like touch. Those are things that set them off. So their, their level of arousal starts to rise. And then they get to school, and they're standing in line, and they get bumped. And that sets them into sensory overload. And then there's more and more events throughout the day that just send them into sensory overload. So that can look like stress, that can look like crying, sadness, meltdowns, because of a sensory event, or many sensory events, because of sensory defensiveness. Um, let's jump to, so we're kind of all over, we started with C, let's go to A now. So A is somebody who is, on high level of arousal. They start their day jumping right out of bed, possibly upset right when they get out of bed or grumpy. Um, if, if this is an adult, this looks like somebody with road rage, okay? They're in overload and they're angry and they're upset. They're on this heightened level of arousal throughout the day. Um, and so, Sometimes I hear from parents, or lots of times I hear from parents that their child doesn't sleep, that they have a hard time sleeping. And I want to know what their level of arousal is before bedtime, because if your level of arousal is high at bedtime, it's really hard to fall asleep. You need your level of arousal to be low at bedtime so that you can drift off and have fantastic dreams. Okay, so sensory overload, they're high, they're in that fight, flight, or fright phase, that high adrenaline phase all the time, okay? They're stressed all the time, um, and we want them to be in this optimal level of arousal. We want to get them down, bring them down, calm them down, make them feel safe, make them trust us, okay? We need to open up that band of optimal level of arousal for them. Someone who is in low arousal um, looks like sadness, right? Um, from, from that movie, Inside Out. So low level of arousal, they're, um, they maybe hit snooze over and over in the morning. I did that. Um, and you know what? The thing with snooze is you hit it because you don't want to get out of bed or you don't want to wake up, but then you're just prolonging that. You're just making, <laughs> stretching out the amount of time that you have to hit snooze. Um, anyways, I digress. So low level of arousal is that low energy, um, sadness, could look like depression. I often say it's Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. You know, he talks really monotone and he doesn't really get excited very often. He stays low. There's sensory events that happen and he just doesn't really respond. You call, this is someone who you call their name and you call their name and you call their name and they're not responding, but you know their hearing is good. They're just not registering that input. Okay, they have a really, really, really big cup for hearing or for whatever sensory system it is and we need to fill that cup we need to lift them up wake them up okay 
We need to increase their level of arousal. <clears throat> so take a minute right now and just think, where do, you, where do I fit in this chart? Map out, I encourage you to sit down and map out your level of arousal throughout the day. What are things that set off your arousal? What might send you into sensory overload? What do you like in the morning? Are you low arousal? Do you need your morning coffee to wake you up? And what about at night? Is your level of arousal high at night and do you have difficulty falling asleep? So just think about that and map that out. Press pause if you want. Okay, and then also think about your child. Where are they on this, on this map or this chart of arousal? Are they in sensory overload? Do they look like Tigger? Or are they angry all the time? So are they bouncing around and can't sit still and talking a mile a minute? Or are they just kind of slow? Okay, something to think about. So here's my question. How does your engine run? When we talk to kids in the schools, we tell them that their body is like a car. And sometimes your engine runs high and sometimes it runs low. And we want your engine to run just right so that you can function and learn and be happy and get along with others. Okay, so like I said before, if your engine's running low, you might look like Eeyore. And if your engine's running high, you might look like Tigger. But really, we want you to be just right, like Winnie the Pooh, and be able to get along with your friends and learn and play and be happy. Okay, we use this chart, and sometimes we change the pictures in this chart. Sometimes fast is a race car, and sometimes slow is a bicycle or, or something slow and just right, or we might put different animals in here. But the idea is that we're using a language to describe how alert we feel. And we can start to label to our kids. We can say, ooh, seems like your engine's running slow today. How about we tickle you and see if we can get you more awake and just right? Or seems like something's getting you down. It seems like your engine's running really fast. How about if I squish you? And we'll talk about some strategies coming up. But we can use that language and a common language between home and school so that we're talking about these engine levels and we're talking about strategies because it's more about the strategies and being able to use these sensory strategies to calm the body down and get the body just right. Um, because sometimes talking, um, it's too slow. The fastest way to calm is through the body. And I think I say that right here. So changing how alert you feel, we can use sensory information and sensory activities to upregulate, so increase arousal, or to downregulate arousal, to calm down. And I have here experienced what calm feels like. I find so many people, so many kids and, and even adults, have a hard time knowing what calm feels like. Um, and so we're kind of in an era where we talk a lot about meditation and mindfulness. And I encourage you to, to just take some time with your kids and take some time for yourself to, to figure out what calm feels like. Can you take five minutes to just center yourself and feel what it feels like? What does it smell like? Is there a smell that goes along with calm? Okay, so, and I just said this in the last slide, but the fastest way to calm is through the body, which is why we want to talk about these sensory activities. Because if your child is up here in over arousal or having a meltdown and crying and screaming, we can say, calm down. Um, but they're not really going to hear that because the language center of their brain isn't working when they're in over arousal. Um, but it's also really slow to talk, do, to do that cognitive therapy 
But if we use sensory therapy, we use these strategies and it goes right to the brain instead of having to bypass through all these um, systems. So yeah, the fastest way to calm is through the body. Um, I have here, you can't regulate others if you can't regulate yourselves. So that's why I said you need to know what calm feels like and you need to take charge of yourself first. So if your child is having a meltdown, and I say meltdown a lot, and what I mean by meltdown is they're lying on the floor crying, but it's different than a tantrum. A tantrum is to get what they want and a meltdown is from sensory overload. So if they're having a meltdown, you need to step away, to step back, give them some space, get yourself calm, and then you can calm your child. But if you're in this heightened arousal and it becomes this, this match back and forth of yelling and screaming, that's not gonna help anybody. And I've been there, so I'm not judging. I've, I've totally been there before. Um, some of these things I say as much for myself as I do for you guys. Um, and this last point, to regulate from overload, you have to pass through chaos. And we say this so many times to parents. It's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And that's why. So we, when you're in overload, you have to pass through this chaos to get to the calm to get to the just right. And at the bottom here, I have when in doubt, use heavy work. So when we're changing how alert you feel, if you don't know if the behavior is overload or low arousal, use heavy work because that is the best way to get the body regulated. Okay, and we're gonna talk about what heavy work is and what it looks like. But first I wanted to just go back a little bit and talk about this stress overload. Um, so remember, that's when the level of arousal is super high. And so stress is not intentional or stress behavior is not intentional. It's not, they're not just trying to be bad. It's not bad behavior, it's stress behavior. So we need to recognize the signs of stress reduce the sensory input so minimize the sounds minimize the visual input turn the lights off that's going to help um, minimize smell so if you're cooking dinner and there's a meltdown maybe cover dinner up for a little bit and let's reduce that sensory input um, and reduce light touch okay light touch is is more stressful and don't talk because like I said before that center in your brain that processes language it turns off when we're in stress so all they're gonna hear is wah, 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 wah. okay so don't talk you're gonna reduce that sensory input and then restore a sense of calmness sense of trust a sense of just right so recognize reduce and restore um, if you want to read more about this, Stuart Shanker has a book called Self Reg, and he talks all about this in his book. It's a great book. Um, so, deep pressure. I said in step two, I said don't do light touch, but deep pressure touch is calming. That's like a big squeeze. Okay, if your child is stressed out, don't talk. Just go in for that big squeeze, a big hug. Give them some space if that's what they need. And then after it's all over, build in activities that will get the brain to just right. Okay, and we're going to talk about those activities. I know in the workshop that I did last night, people were like, well, tell us the activities. We're getting there, okay? <laughs> Um, okay, and then under responsive is that low level of arousal. With these kids, we want to increase their sensory input. We want to wake them up, okay? But you need to be aware that they might have a narrow band of optimal. So they're low, and then they get into that optimal zone, 
and that might set them into an over arousal. So if you begin with proprioceptive input, that's heavy work and some pressure touch, that might jumpstart their system enough and not send them into that sensory overload. It's always best to get some advice from an occupational therapist who is trained in sensory processing so that you can play around with these activities and find the right activities for your child. You can fill out a sensory profile or a sensory processing measure that will help you identify where your child is high, where your child is low, and then you can find the activities that are just right for your child. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just move my picture here so you can see. So proprioception. This is, like I said, when in doubt, use heavy work. Heavy work is proprioception. It occurs when we move and use our muscles. So pushing and pulling activities, um, using a rope, pulling on a rope, pushing against the wall, doing push-ups, doing any sort of resistance exercises. TheraBand is a great proprioceptive activity because you're always getting that, that resistance against movement. I just looked out my window and there's a deer. I saw these two deer ears. Um, so carrying heavy items. So at home, getting your kids to help you carry the groceries in, getting your kids to bring the laundry basket up the stairs, um, getting your kids to push you in the laundry basket or you push them. Um, those are some good heavy activities. Animal walks are fun and, and they're good for, they develop the muscles in the hands, but it's, it's a good calming activity. Playground equipment, so climbing and um, pulling yourself on the, the different playground equipment. Moving furniture is proprioceptive work. Doing chores around the house. But my favorite proprioceptive work is chewing gum. Now, there's these muscles in our jaw, our TMJ, or temporal mandibular joint, and they are the most powerful, that's the most powerful input of proprioception. So chewing gum helps kids to focus. And I know schools don't like when we recommend that they chew gum, but we make rules. There are rules that go with chewing gum, and if you don't follow the rules, you don't get your gum. But if it helps you, if it's a tool that helps you to focus, you're probably going to follow the rules or you're going to try. Okay. Um, if you need other ideas for heavy work activities, I have oodles. So just send me a message and I will send you um, some information about heavy work activities. I have heavy work activities for the classroom, heavy work activities for home, for small spaces, you name it. Okay, so touch. Deep pressure touch releases oxytocin. And oxytocin, oxytocin is a chemical, a neurochemical that makes us happy. So when we touch someone or give somebody a big hug, that releases oxytocin in us. It releases oxytocin in the person we're hugging. And if you happen to be around and witness that hug, it releases oxytocin in you as a witness. So hugging is so such a great um, activity, but it's deep pressure and it's that's calming, okay? So touch is calming, it's organizing. Um, it is more accepted if you are giving touch from the front, okay? So if you come up to somebody from behind and put your hands on them, that might send them into that fight or flight phase. But if you come at them from the front, and if you touch in their web space, so that's this space here between the thumb and the index finger, um, there's a trigger point there. And that is, if somebody is um, sensitive to touch and you can access that web space, that will help to calm them. Um, rough housing is great um, for deep pressure touch. And it's a great activity for dads. We often talk about things for moms to do, but this is where dads can come in and do some roughhousing. 
um, a lycra wrap is just a piece of lycra or there's also lycra bags that you can buy commercially if you want to know where to buy them just send me a message and I'll let you know um, but the kids can go in the lycra bag or be in the lycra wrap and then they can they can move around in it and they get some tactile feedback from that some resistance a bear hug can be just that big squeeze from you I wish you guys could see this deer out my window. Um, so it can be a big squeeze from you or a bear hug is an actual commercial item from Southpaw, I believe, and it looks like a lumbar support. So you put it around your waist or the child's waist and it's snug. It's like a neoprene and then there's straps that pull up over the shoulder. Uh, and that some kids like that for that constant touch and some kids like that if they're sensitive to touch They will wear a bear hug and that helps them feel um, a little bit better. They don't they're not as sensitive to that touch um, Massages so that's again that deep touch That is calming We play games called steamroller. We did this at our workshop last night I had three people lie down and I rolled on top of them and that's called steamroller, but you can do any version of steamroller where the child lies on the floor and you roll over top of them with a therapy ball or you roll over top of them with one of those big foam rollers. Um, and that's just giving them that deep pressure touch to their whole body. Hot dog is a game that we play where the child lies between two mats or at home they lie between two pillows. Okay, so there's pillow, the child, and then another pillow, and they become the hot dog between the bun. And then you squish on the different things that they like on their hot dog. So you say, what do you like on your hot dog? And then you squish on ketchup and mustard. And, you know, I've squished on all kinds of things, cheese and pickles. And then they start getting into all these things that are really gross and you just keep squishing. <laughs> and it's kind of fun. Pizza is a similar game. You roll out the dough, so the child is the dough, and you have to stretch out the dough and then put all the toppings on. There's actually a book called Pete's Pizza. I think that's what it's called. Um, and it's a book that is all about the squishing game. So you can read the book and do the activity. Turtle is um, the child lies down and you put a beanbag chair on their back and then they have to be the turtle walking around and the beanbag is the shell. Um, we gain a lot of body awareness through our tactile system. It tells us where our body is in space and it helps us develop this map. So um, when you go to the city, you need a map or your GPS to tell you where you're going. And same thing, we have our tactile system and touch helps us to map out our motor activities because we need to know where our body is. We need to know where our hands are so that we can touch our fingers. We need to know where our fingers are so we can hold the pencil without looking at where our fingers are. So we have to have experience touching different things so that we know where our fingers and where our body's supposed to be. If you've ever picked up a water bottle or an item and you thought that it was full or heavy and you go to pick it up and you're, have you ever done that where you pick something up and you unexpectedly, it's unexpectedly lighter than, than what you thought so in your mind the map didn't match what what it really was that kind of makes sense um so we can explore different things with messy play and and rice bins and bins with um with all kinds of different things you can put noodles and rice and um what else have i seen in bins i'm drawing a blank right now um you know, a sand bin or any sort of tactic. You can have buttons in bins and 
all kinds of things. And then you hide items in the bins that the kids have to then go find. Okay, so this is going to be exploring and using our sense of touch. One of my favorite activities is I have a bag or a shirt that, I wonder if I have it here, no. So I have this shirt that I've sewn up the top of it. So the top and the bottom of the shirt are closed, but the hands can go in through the sleeves and the kids have to reach in and feel in the feely bag for the items. So I'll have some items laid out and that are the same as the items in the bag. And I say, okay, go find this item, go find the key. So they have to reach in with their hands and find the key. <clears throat> I've talked a lot about the whole body tactile experience. So that's things like steamroller, hot dog, any sort of squishing activities. Um, other things like I've seen this and I actually just heard that at the universities they have this where I've seen it for little kids where you take a box or a hamper, a clothes hamper, laundry basket, and you put items in that and then the child goes inside that that laundry hamper and can read their book. So they're getting whole body tactile input within this bag. And Lycra is really good for that. Lycra swings and Lycra hammocks are really good for that too. But I guess at the university, at the University of Lethbridge, they have these whole body tactile bins that you can go sit in um, and get your body calm before exams. And I thought, that is so cool. So I'm gonna go check that out. Um, and then just one final note here is that gentle and quick rubbing and light touch are more alerting, whereas deep pressure, um, constant touch, and slow touch are more calming. Okay, so movement. If we use slow rhythmic movement in a linear plane, it's calming. So just think when you're rocking a baby, you are going slow, linear, okay? You're rocking back and forth, linear is back and forth or side to side. You're going slow and rhythmic and that is to calm the baby. If you're going fast and erratic, it's more alerting, okay? So if you're on a swing and you're going back and forth, that is calming. If you're on a swing and you're going like fast or you're spinning, that is more alerting but be cautious of that rotary action because it does not take very much rotary action, so spinning, to send somebody into sensory overload. Okay, so things to look for are like the flush face, the diluted or dilated pupils, okay, big pupils, sweating, vomiting, obvious one, okay? So watch out for those things. So, Kids need a lot of movement, and I think there's studies that show that when we're sitting, 80% of our frontal lobe is turned off, so we need to be up and moving and activating that frontal lobe of our brain, so things like swings and slides and large balls and bolsters and playgrounds and bouncing and obstacle courses and at schools, and at home, we can do things like yoga and just dance. Get your kids working out with you. Um, get your kids moving. They need to move. Um, create a non-video game with checkpoints. So that goes with the obstacle courses. So you can set up an obstacle course in your classroom or in your home that is like, Minecraft and the kids have to go through this Minecraft video game. That's not a video game. It's movement um, But you're using those things that you're playing into the things that they like Minecraft or Mario or whatever it is that that kids like for video games Lego is big in our house. So using those things and Okay, you want to build Lego? Well, let's spread your Lego pieces out around the house or around the room and you have to go over things and under things and around and um, you have to hop to the next station and um, you maybe you have to answer a math question to go on to the next level, okay? So you can incorporate learning and homework um, into movement activities. 
Cosmic Yoga is a really um, interesting yoga program that you can Google if you're not aware of it. I mean, they have Star Wars yoga, they've got frozen yoga, and, and all these different themes that get kids interested in moving. Um, Go Noodle is another fun dance program. Be careful with those ones, though. They tend to be more alerting than calming. And so I always say if we're doing a lot of alerting activities and we're getting the kids maybe more excited than we want them to, finish off with some deep pressure. So I was at a conference and we, at the beginning of each um, part of the day, this was a Brendan Bouchard conference, we jumped around and we danced. And then I thought he was brilliant doing this. He said, okay, thank you for coming. Turn to five people and give them a big hug and say, thank you for being here. And in my head, I was like, he's trying to regulate us. He's getting us to jump around and dance and then give five big hugs because that's going to help bring you to a just right level to be able to sit in this conference and learn. So try that in your classroom, try that at home. Okay. Oops, too fast. Okay, so those are the big three um, ticket items, touch, proprioception, and vestibular. Those are the ones that are gonna have the most impact, but these next ones are looking at our environment. So visually, do, if we want to have a calm environment, we need to have soft, natural colors. Um, maybe put up room dividers or screens that are going to help us to focus or be calm. Um, some schools will have, you know, those, um, they'll just have pieces of cardboard at each person's desk, and that's like a study carol that helps the kids to be able to focus when they need to focus. Okay, and keep visual input steady for a calming effect, have more irregular speeds of movement um, and bringing objects close to the face for alerting activities. I don't use a lot of the visual stuff except um, in the lighting that I choose for my space. Um, so oral motor, we talked about chewing and gum, but Calming activities are things like sucking and slow breathing. And sometimes it's hard to teach kids about slow breathing, but it's really important. And you can do things like take a milk jug or take one of those big water jugs and put a straw in, like, or a big piece of tubing and get the kids to blow, like with, you put bubble mixture in the bottom of the bottle and then get them to blow bubble mountain. And that helps to teach them that calm blowing. Okay, some kids might suck, but they'll only suck the bubble mixture once, <laughs> um, but get them to practice blowing, and even humming a tune while they're blowing is going to get that calm, slow breathing. Um, and then alerting activities would be chewing, um, sucking or eating citrus, salty and sour foods, and then cold foods. I did a handout, um, and I think you can still get it if you go to my website or if you message me. I have a whole handout about sensory snacks. So um, yeah, send me a message and I will get you that handout. Sounds. There's lots of research about different um, different sounds and different in intensities of sounds and different frequencies that are alerting and calming. Basically, if you think of when you're driving in the car, what mu music is going to calm you or like put you to sleep and what's gonna be more alerting to you, right? Loud music is gonna be more alerting and might send you into sensory overload, whereas Classical music is probably more calming, okay? Um, white noise can be calming and help some kids with sleep or just help them with being able to focus. Okay, you can play around with the intensity and the pitch and the beat. Okay, there's lots of, um, there's different listening programs that, that kids can put on headphones and 
that's going to help them to be able to focus. It's different um, things that they have to listen to and then perform activities. You can look into that. Um, I don't think I've mentioned it yet about like if you're sensitive to sound, you can use some of these calming techniques, but you can also block out the sound. So use noise reduction headphones. Um, you can get them at like Napa Auto Parts and it's just the big, big headphones. You don't have to go to a specialty store. You can just go to like a hardware store and get those. There's other ones that you can get online that are like your, they're like earbuds, um, but they are noise reduction. I also saw on Pinterest where you can take an earbud and then you take a, an ear plug, like the, the ones that you wear if you're working on heavy equipment and you fit them together and then you put them in your ear and it reduces the noise. And then the big thing about that is with older kids, you can't see it. So older kids that are sensitive to sound, they don't want to have these big headphones on. They want to just fit in. And so giving them ones that are more discreet can help. So this, there, this is in one of the handouts in the opt-in, but this is a picture, just do you know me? This could be any kid with sensory, sensory processing issues. Um, they could have all of these issues or one or two of them. So maybe they complain about the tags in their clothes or maybe they're a picky eater and they resist new foods or textures. Um, maybe they cover their eyes from the bright lights. Maybe they don't like having their hair washed or cut. Okay, so this I just put up there for you to look through. And maybe there's your child has some of these issues. Maybe you know somebody with some of these issues. And if you're having problems with any of these areas, contacting an occupational therapist can help. Okay, so. We are almost done. Thank you so much for sticking with me. So <clears throat> I'm an occupational therapist and I work privately. I do have some contracts with different school boards. An occupational therapist with training in sensory integration can help identify your child's sensory needs and design a sensory diet or sensory program that meets your child's specific needs. People ask me, how do you pay for this? You can pay out of pocket. Some benefit programs will cover occupational therapy, so talk to your benefit provider. Family services for children with disabilities, you can talk to them. School programs, talk to your school and see if you can get a referral to occupational therapy or see if they would pay for it. Um, and then Alberta Health Services has occupational therapy. So, what's next? Okay, so some things that I am working on. I'm working on a course called Parenting Through the Senses, and that is a more in-depth look at our sensory systems, at sensory processing, and at functional issues and practical solutions for you. So I'm going to be sending out a questionnaire or a survey to you guys who participated in this workshop because I want to know what you want more of. If I'm designing a course for you, I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you need um, so that I can help um, give you some solutions, help give you the right information. Okay, then the other thing that I'm really excited about, and I actually just got off the phone about this before I started recording, I am working on a sensory bus that will be a mobile sensory clinic for rural southern Alberta. So the idea is that I will bring sensory services to your community and I can come to your door, I can come to your school, I can be at the park and I can help you and your child figure out what will best meet their sensory needs I think it's going to be wicked. I think it's going to be awesome. And I'm totally excited for that. So I will be sending out information about that in my newsletter. So make sure that you've signed up for my newsletter and just be on the lookout because I really need your support for this sensory bus. 
I need to know if it's something that you guys want, if it's something that you think you would utilize. So watch for that coming down the line. And that's it. We're done. So thank you for joining me for Sensory Basics. Again, I'm Erin Gruitt. Here's my email. It's erin at sensationalpath.com. Please email me if you have questions or concerns. You can call me. Um, and you can check out my website, sensationalpath.com. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad that you were here and that this technology worked for us. So I look forward to uh, sharing more information with you in the future.